Hi everyone. Today, 15 people who left their homes in Mumbai for their office in the morning or to their college or school in the morning will not reach back home in the evening. Because in the morning as they were leaving the home and going to the office, or maybe in the evening from the college they were going back home, to save some time, they would have crossed the railway tracks of Mumbai. But there, they would have got hit by a train and they would have died. 6,000 people die on the railway tracks of Mumbai every year. Anil Kartkokova, the high-level committee on railway safety, in their report said, no civilized society can accept this massacre on our railway system. When railway asked us to study this problem, the first thing I and my team did was to go to those accident spots where the deaths are happening the most. As I stood on those particular accident spots beside the railway tracks, the first thought that came to my mind is, how can someone get hit by a train here? Because I can see a train coming in from both directions for almost a kilometer away. Why should someone get hit by a train that they can see coming? But standing there beside the railway tracks of Mumbai, I started questioning that very concept of the conscious, rational man. If man was rational, the most, the rational thing for him to do is to take that foot over bridge, which is slightly far away, and cross the railway tracks. That's the safest thing to do. That's the most rational thing to do. If he was conscious of all that was happening around him, the moment he sees a train coming in, he should have stood back and allowed the train to pass by. But that was not what they were doing. Hundreds, thousands were crossing the railway tracks in front of incoming trains. It's not just this problem. While working on some of the other problems, for example, road safety. The road from Bangalore to Hyderabad was one of the first highways we studied. And I looked at the behavior of the drivers and said, why are they driving so recklessly, despite all the warning signages that are there? Or recently, during the COVID time, across the world, we study this problem that despite the warnings from the highest levels of health authorities and political leadership, people were refusing to take the vaccine, a life-saving vaccine. And that is where the whole question said, what is really driving human behavior? Is it our rational, conscious self or something else is driving it? In order to answer this question, I went definitely much deeper into human behavior. I read a lot of books, but I realized almost immediately that if I had to understand human behavior, I had to understand the source of human behavior. And all our human thoughts, our actions, come from one part of our body, between our ears, from our brain. So I said, if I have to understand the, the human behavior, I have to understand the functioning of the human brain. Because the more we understand the inscrutable algorithms that are happening between our ears, better will be our ability to understand human behavior. But the first book I picked up on the human brain, I realized that with 86 billion neurons, each of those neurons having 1,000 to 10,000 connections. We're talking about trillions of connections between our ears. And those, by number, is far more than the basic fundamental particles in the whole universe. Which means, my brain and your brain is far more complex, or maybe the most complex system in the whole universe. The first significant person to study human behavior and said there could be things happening below the, the, the level of consciousness 
was Sigmund Freud. And his theory was the big hit in, 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 in the early part of 20th century, where he said there's a fairly substantial part of the human behavior that is happening below the thresholds of consciousness. But by the second half of 20th century, when neuroscience really started developing as a science, I think the psychoanalysis theory of Freud could not really stand the test, the rigor that the test of neuroscience and that theory started subsiding in its importance. But the time when the 1950s, when psychoanalysis was at its peak, there was another incident that took the whole this understanding of human behavior below the thresholds of consciousness to a very different height. That is 12th of September 1957. A person by the name James Vigory, a market researcher in New York, said, I've done an experiment. And what is that experiment? He said, you know, in the New Jersey theater, what I did was using a special instrument, as people were watching the show, I put a message, drink Coke and eat popcorn. But at almost a millisecond level, I, you know, I just projecting it several times during the show. And his press release said, he found that those people who were exposed to these subliminal stimuli, 58% increase was there in their popcorn consumption, and there was 18% increase in the Coke consumption. And with that he said, I have found a way called subliminal advertising, a way to influence the behavior of humans below the thresholds of consciousness. All hell broke loose in the United States. That was the 50s, was a time when United States was all awash with the fears of communism, brainwashing, mind control. Here is someone talking about influencing behavior at a level below consciousness. But some people also started testing this, and they found these tests were not replicable. And then came the anticlimax. In an interview with the advertising age, James Vickery admitted, I never did that experiment. Uh, it was a bit of a hoax because, you know, I, my, my market research business wasn't doing all that well, so I wanted to create a sort of a little, you know, uh, a story around it, so people started giving me more business. So, with Freud's inability to provide a scientific explanation or a proof for his theory, or James Vickery's whole fiasco about his subliminal advertising experiment, I think after that people, no one wanted to talk about anything to do with something happening below the, the thresholds of consciousness. And so, the traditional belief that we have, that man is a rational, conscious man, continued as strong as what it could be. It, I think it was, I think uh, the year was, could be 2003. A book came out, and that book was written by uh, Gerald Altman, the professor emeritus of Harvard Business School. And the book, How Customers Think, he said, 95% of the human process, brain processes happen below the thresholds of consciousness, and only 5% happens at the level, at the conscious level. And all the existing market research techniques can only dwell, are only dwelling into those 5% which is consciously available. So much so he developed a research technique called Altman Metaphor Elicitation Technique, ZMET, to actually dwell far deeper into the thresholds of behavior below the consciousness. But the real significant study about the difference between conscious and non-conscious behavior came from uh, Professor Zimmerman, M. Zimmerman, of the Institute of Psychology at Heidelberg University. In his 1989 paper, which actually said the, the, the neural system in the context of information theory, he said something. Of the 11 million bits of processing that is there in our brain, just 40 of them, yes, you heard it right, just 40 of them are actually functioning at a conscious level, which means 
99.9999% of human behavior is being processed at a non-conscious level. And our consciousness has no access to that. The significance of this information was best captured by Shankar Vedantam in his book, Hidden Brain. And in that book he said, this new understanding of human behavior constitutes a revolution no less intriguing, perhaps far more powerful than the discovery that the sun really does not revolve around the earth. Now, when we have such a paradigm-shifting knowledge, we said, okay, let's take this knowledge to the railway tracks of Mumbai. And can we then now look at the problem as to why people are getting hit by a train through the lens of such the vastness of the non-conscious of our brain? And that's when we came across the work of Professor H.W. Lobovich of uh, Penn University. He said, and he has discovered, that, you know, our brain has a deficiency. Evolutionary, our brain was very good is judging the speed of small things like rabbits and deers. And our forefathers could the judge, judge the speed of it, throw the stone or a spear and kill it and have their breakfast that day. But evolutionarily, human brain hasn't seen large objects like elephants and giraffes not move fast. So our brain has a deficiency. And that's what Professor Lebovich discovered. That when you see an incoming large object, we underestimate the speed of that large object by close to 40%. Now that explained what was happening on the railway tracks of Mumbai. I said, see train coming in far, I'm walking in, oh, I can walk. And I start taking those steps, but suddenly I realize the train is much closer than what it is. <sighs> it's too late. Yes, we discovered this insight. Now, how do we solve then this problem? If we believe so much in the conscious part of it, we could have done, say, for example, what the automotive industry does. Because on the rear view mirrors of our vehicles, there is that objects in the mirror are closer than what they appear. It has never appeared to us in our eyes. So similarly, we could have put up boats across Bombay by saying, trains are faster than what you think, so be careful. And now that communication to the conscious wouldn't have worked. But my design team went deeper and said, how, does, how do we judge speed uh, of, of things at, at a non-conscious level? And that's when we realized, we can, our brain can judge speed of something only if there is a reference point. If there's no reference point as it happens when you're on a flight, we can't judge the speed. Oh, then how can we give a reference point to the people who are trespassing across the railway tracks? We said, oh, we knew the place where people trespass is constant. The direction in which the train comes is also constant. So what did my team do? We left about four or five sleepers you know, empty here. The next five sleepers were painted in yellow paint. Next 15 sleepers were left empty. The next five were painted in yellow color. The next 15 were left empty. The next five was painted. So we have about painted about four to five such groups of uh, five sleepers. When the train comes from there, the speed at which these group of yellow paints disappear becomes a reference for people. And people stand back and allow the train to pass by. We tested this in Vadala, because that is where the accident rates in Mumbai were going up the highest. We studied this for one year to see what the effects are. And what we found is we managed to reduce the accidents in the highest you know, uh, accident plays in Mumbai by 75%. Later, we implemented this solution in Thane, Kalwa, Mumbra, again with great results. But even as I told you about an experiment that has proven the power of the non-conscious, how many of us still believe in it? What I told you, I know we're finding it difficult to believe. You know, I know that, because that belief in the consciousness is so ingrained in our thinking. You know, the whole, 
the you know the 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 the, the morality or the moral principles that have been taught to us from religion or even the judgments of our judicial system are all based on one fundamental belief that very substantial part of our decision making is actually based at at a conscious level now that when you hear that 99.999% of our brain processes happen at a non conscious level is too much of a change if it you said is 20% or 30% of our processes are the non conscious we could have believed but not this and so this biological fact that 99.999% of human uh, brain's decision making process happens at a non conscious level is actually is one of the most hidden truths about human behavior but what does our experiments and the railway tracks of mumbai and a whole lot of other projects around the world is telling you is if you and i can acknowledge this biological fact if you and i can understand this non conscious process even more more so if you and i can use the power of this vast non conscious processes of the human brain better will be our ability to develop solutions to solve many of the significant human behavior problems in the world and make this world a better place to live in thank you